Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending March 3rd, 2018. First up, this is from Gadgets360. Almost no one is making a living on YouTube. Uh, this is probably going to be the only TDD report about the YouTube. I don't know what you would call it, the debacle going on where they're demonetizing a lot of people, especially the mid-level players and the um, small players. But uh, according to this article, and I'll read a little bit of it, one of the main attractions of YouTube is that anyone can become a star. There are no gatekeepers, no talent agents, or television executives needed to be won over. Stars can come from anywhere, and they do. Forbes' recent list of Richard, richest YouTubers is proof. And then they talk about Daniel Middleton, a uh, 26-year-old British gamer who made $16.5 million last year. But the new study finds that the odds of striking it rich on YouTube or even making a modest living are vanishingly small. If you just barely inch into the top 3.5%, that means you make somewhere between 12000 and 16000 a year. Uh, not much of a living unless you maybe share an apartment or something like that. That'd be roughly, uh, what, eight bucks an hour or less. So um, the study found that it's getting harder for new creators to reach the top as YouTube alone adds 300 hours of video every minute and the biggest stars become more successful. That's my dog making noise. The median views on videos has also plummeted to 89. The median views per video has plummeted to 89 in 2016 from 10,262 a decade ago. So. Uh, the top 3% of channels got 64% of all views. I guess with music streaming services, too, it's making it very hard for the top people to break into music, too. Uh, you can get your stuff streamed and listened to, but uh, less than 1% of songs represented 86% of the music streamed last year, according to the market research firm Nielsen. And since no one buys music these days, making even a little money from streaming requires songs to be played millions of times. So even if your song gets airplay two or three times a month for a few months, it's basically not going to make you anything. So same way they're finding in television too, with so many markets coming up too. It says there's nearly 500 scripted original series um, that are aired each year and the traditional networks are being challenged by cable outlets and streaming services. Yeah, Netflix, uh, even YouTube is making its own original content, so less and less chance for anybody to hit the big time now. So if you're thinking of making any kind of living in YouTube, you better have something that's going to go viral and have a, a lot of material to back up to. You see a lot of channels that do fairly well for a while, but then they just run out of material. So anyway, if you want to check this out as usual, the links to all the articles I'm talking about will be down in the description below. Next up from Popular Mechanics, NASA says that the moon's water may be widespread. This is going to help if we're thinking about going back to the moon in a few years before we venture onto Mars. Evidence that water on the moon's surface is widely distributed and not confined to a certain region or type of terrain has been found when data from two lunar missions was analyzed. Um, here's the quote. We find that it doesn't matter what time of day or which latitude we look at, the signal indicating water always seems to be present, said Joshua Banfield, a senior research scientist at the Space Science Institute in Boulder, Colorado, and lead author of the new study published in Nature Geoscience. The presence of water doesn't appear to depend on the composition of the surface, and the water sticks around. So the findings could help researchers understand the origin of moon's water and how easy it would be to use as a resource. Yeah, we're going to need plenty of that, and if we have to end up launching uh, water along with the astronauts and stuff like that, that's very expensive water, something like tens of thousands of dollars per pound to take that stuff to the moon so hopefully that will uh, help out if that is true so and then uh, last up from popular science and this is an this is something I've been wanting to talk about for quite a while um, kids can be citizen scientists too there's nothing like getting kids interested in science whether it be your children grandchildren nieces nephews or even next-door neighbor kids and uh, this article from popular science shows how you can do that and they give as one of many examples um, searching for birds there's a project uh, and it's a birding birding app, and uh, it's asking for kids to go out in nature and actually observe in the area you live or wherever you end up visiting to uh, actually do a survey of what birds you actually see or hear songs of, or they even want you to report back if you don't see very many birds. You can even report back the absence of birds. Um, they actually um, thought that maybe this was going to end up being, uh, they're, they're up to, let's see, let me get this right. In that time, citizen scientists from around the world have submitted 99,999,000 999 photo sound clips and geographical uh, tags for birds they saw in real life. Those observations have been used by the app creators at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, the hundred millionth observation finally arrived. Everyone thought it would be a big time birder, but it ended up being a 12-year-old boy. Lyron Gartsman of Vancouver, Canada 
had identified 24 species on a hike that day. His photo of an American robin made the eBird app history. So he ended up being the uh, uh, 100 millionth one. So it was a great day to be in K through 12 education, said Fee, who works with teachers around the country to introduce assignments that focus on uh, indoor or on uh, outdoor observations and bring citizen scientists into the classroom. But not only do they talk about this too, they talk about uh, a lot of other stuff you can get involved in too, not just um, birding. You can get involved in, if you want to uh, dig up a little sample of dirt from your backyard, there's a thing called the Citizen Soil Collection Program, and I'll have a link to it down here. This is from the University of Oklahoma, and they just ask you to submit it so that they can test the different kinds of fungus that grows in your backyard because they're thinking of all the different types and many to, uh, that have been yet to be identified. They could find a form of uh, fungus that can actually help to uh, cure cancer or maybe other diseases. They will actually take your soil sample and test it. And with a lot of these programs, I think this one too, um, you're going to get full credit for it. If you end up being the person that discovers a cure for a certain type of cancer based on the fungus found in your backyard or wherever you uh, take the soil sample from um, and send it in, you're going to get full credit for it as the person uh, uh, that made the discovery. So um, if you get a chance to do that too. Also, many programs with, uh, like I talked about before, and these things, they don't have to be children either. Adults can participate in these things just as good, but these things I think are geared more towards uh, children to be able to participate along with the adults. But I had talked before about um, just picking a star to observe, even with a set of binoculars, and just observe that star night after night or on somewhat of a semi-regular basis and reporting in if anything unusual happens with the star. Astronomers want to uh, be able to look at certain stars, but they just the telescope time is so valuable and so limited that they can't just keep telescopes, especially the big expensive ones, pointed at certain stars they would like to. They have to be used for other things too that are important. So if somebody can actually observe that star and note any changes that they're looking for and let them know about it, you can actually report that back as a trusted observer. I think if you just look that up on the internet too, you can find the, the links to that. And it gives all kinds of links. If you read this article and check out the links, you'll be able to find something. But there are so many things the citizen scientists can do to help the regular scientists, or maybe even help uh, cure diseases. I could also get into the um, SETI app program, too, to where you can run SETI on your computer to help uh, analyze uh, signals from outer space. They even now have an Android app. I don't think they have an iPhone app yet, but they do have an Android app for the SETI at Home project, so you could use some of your spare computer time. Um, also, to do gene folding uh, for curing different diseases, you could use a little bit of your computer cycles in the background, and you can you can set it so that it only uses off cycles when you're not doing anything, so it will not slow your computer down appreciably at all, but uh, anything like that to help. So I would encourage everybody, get children interested in science. I see so many science programs being cut back, especially when I asked about the schools around me, and I asked my grandchildren about their science courses, and I found out it's not a full-time subject anymore. They do not take science all year long. It's uh, either a semester or half a semester, I think it is. So it's cut way back, and I would really like to see science programs come back as a full-time subject in the schools. But um, you can do a lot as a parent, like I said, as a parent, grandparent, um, aunt, uncle, something like that. Get any kids you know interested in science in any way you can. Go out with them on a, on a hike. and. Uh, if you don't know it yourself, learn what the different trees are around. Um, can your kids or your grandkids even tell a maple tree from an oak tree, from a pine tree, from a cottonwood tree? I mean, uh, kids nowadays, I would be surprised if they could even um, give you the uh, examples of five different species of trees in the neighborhood. Could they walk through the grass and even tell you, other than a dandelion, uh, what three or four other weeds growing in the grass are? Um, I doubt it, really, but it would be nice to, uh, to, to give them some kind of help to be able to do stuff like that. So anyway, um, I also, as a last link here, this was sent by my friend. Let me get this up here, too. This was um, Diana W., my friend, sent this link to me, too. And it's a nice uh, little video. It's not a very long video, but it's about a little girl that got interested in collecting cockroaches. And uh, she collected five originally, and now she has quite a few more. And it's an interesting little video to watch about this girl and her collection of cockroaches. And uh, I'm guessing her parents approve because it seems like, you know, the way it was taken and everything like that. But that is her hobby. She uh, loves her little cockroaches. So if you get a chance, click on that YouTube video and, and watch this little girl and, and her collection of uh, cockroaches. She's not afraid to handle them. She's not afraid of bugs, anything like that. So anyway, that's about it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.